I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we're going to be. Jesus preached one of the greatest sermons ever to be known called the Sermon on the Mount. And he has thousands of people that are listening to this sermon. It is one of the greatest pieces of literature ever to be recorded in history. But it's one of the most prominent pieces of literature that we find in the Bible. Jesus had a lot to say about what it meant to be a person who follows after God. And if God is for us, we should be for God. What does that look like? Well, simply put, I can put it like this. If God is for those who are stressed, we should be too. If God is for the people who are filled with shame, we should be too. If God is for people who are sinners, we should be too. And so it's all about how we can be on God's side. That's kind of what this sermon series is about. Now, when I think about stressful moments in my life, I mean, there have been a lot, starting from childhood to being in high school to being a young adult, now to being a a person who's been married uh, for 10 years with two kids. I mean, there are a lot of things that can bring stress on our lives. And I think everybody in here probably has a different story and can point to a different time when they have been totally stressed out because they have worried themselves to death. You know that 30% of deaths are heart-related? 30%. That's a lot. And the reason why a lot of people die because of their heart is because they put a ton of stress and a lot of worry on their heart. And they, and it's nine times out of 10, it's probably stress that is totally undue. Here's the crazy thing about worry. Worry is a big deal because worry not just affects our mind, it affects our emotions and it even affects our body. And Jesus is going to go through a chunk of scripture here about the worried, people who are worried out because of stress. I mean, we, we think about things like this. As parents, we think, what if, what if my kids keep going down the wrong path? Parents, have you ever been there? What about teenagers? What if I don't make the team? Will my dad still love me? I remember having some of those same feelings. What about us as men um, what if there's a, uh, who work? What if there's another round of layoffs? What if I lose my job? You ever been stressed out or worried about your job? What about you as a teenager? What if you say, what if I can't make friends and no one likes me and I don't fit in and I just don't get along with anybody and I'll be friendless for the rest of my life? I've been there. What about for those of you who are single? Will I ever meet the right person? Will I live the rest of my life alone? What about those of you who have been divorced? Will I ever find love again? Will anybody love me truly even though I'm in this state of brokenness? You see, we worry about a lot of stuff. And worry smothers and chokes, the Bible says. Worry chokes the life out of us. It's like, it's like UFC, putting somebody in a stranglehold, wrapping the chokehold in, and it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And the biggest part of it is, is that we could get the person off our back if we will just stop worrying. Read along with me in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, where Jesus says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about these things? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the richest king ever to be known, not even Solomon and all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O you of little faith, So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, yet your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry for tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Now I want you to picture yourself sitting in front of Jesus, thousands of people around you, and you're hearing Jesus talk about topic after topic, and he gets to the subject of worry, and that is you. You're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, you're worried about your future, and interestingly enough, he talks about money in the preceding passage. And so he, he talks about money, and then he deals with this subject of worry. And he says, do not worry about these things. God is for you. He knows what you need. He's going to take care of you. 
Place yourself in the first century mind, see how you would feel, and then let the words of Jesus take root in your heart. The first thing that we're going to look at here is the state of our worry. And simply put, if Jesus were to be here today, he would say, don't do it, even if you have to sacrifice everything. Don't do it. Don't worry. It's not worth your life. It's not worth your time. Four times in this passage, Jesus says this, do not worry. And whenever you study the Bible and something is repeated over and over and over again, especially in the context of just a few short passages of scripture, it's usually for the point of emphasis. Do not worry. You see, we get pressured in life. We get pressured because of our jobs. We get pressured because of social status. We get pressured because of our worry some about our kids, about our culture, the way our society is going to go. And we let this pressure build up in our heart. And then then we worry. We change how we start thinking. We change the way that we behave. And then we end up failing. We lose because we allow ourselves to worry. I'm a big fan of John Maxwell. He's one of the greatest leaders of our time. The guy teaches hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. One of the most successful businessmen. The, The man is a Christian. He was a former preacher. And he talks about this when it comes to worry. He says, there was a time in early business dealings where our revenues were much lower than I desired or expected, and I began to worry a lot. I started to obsess over money and the revenues that we needed. It began to affect my weekends, my wife, our communication, and my time with my kids. I was short and panicky and frustrated constantly. This led me to putting pressure on relationships, which everyone can feel, to buy my services. You see, you're so worried about not having money that it changes the way you think about your situation, which changes your behavior. And so he starts pressuring people to buy his stuff, and he starts acting in ways that a normal person wouldn't act. He goes on to say this, that in turn led to some distancing, which ultimately led to less business from the people I was working on helping. Worry had gained control. It then started affecting my personality. I became unattractive in business because I was perceived as needy. That behavior led back to my fears and once again became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Worry led me to reality. And I think that's true for all of us. I mean, let's, let's take the business model out of it and let's just put that on our relationships. If you're constantly worried that your spouse is going to leave you or cheat on you or doesn't love you, that's going to affect the way you think about them and it's going to affect your behavior towards them. If you're constantly worried about your kids not succeeding in life or making bad decisions or something bad happening to them, you're going to become this helicopter obsessive parent that doesn't give your kids any freedom and they're not going to want to be around you. It's going to drive them to want to say, man, mom and dad are crazy. I got to get out of here. That's what worry can lead you to. If you're constantly worried about your job, one of the worst things you can be as a leader is insecure. Insecurity drives you to do things and say things that you normally wouldn't do. We need to try to get away from being insecure and just try to trust the people around us because insecure people are not enjoyable people to be around. You start thinking about how you need to impress your boss and how you need to outstage those around you and you stop working for the good of those around you and you start focusing on yourself. I mean, we could go through a lot of illustrations and reasons why we get worried and what worry does to us. But yet here in verse 25, Jesus simply says, "Do not worry." Maybe some of your translations have be not anxious. Anxious. Another way that we could understand this idea of worry or stress or, or anxiety is be not unduly concerned. And I think this is a really important point of clarification here. Jesus is not saying be apathetic in every aspect of your life and don't be concerned about anything. Don't be concerned about your time or your money or your relationships. It's one thing to be concerned. It's an entirely different thing to be worried. You see, a concerned person develops a plan. A concerned person creates action. A concerned person has momentum. They make decisions. A worried person, on the other hand, is paralyzed from doing anything. They create these mental images and these situations in their mind and they obsess about them and it paralyzes the person from doing anything. You obsess over the things that often haven't even happened rather than creating a plan based on concern and careful thought. You see the difference? If I could put it like this, I would, I would say worry paralyzes us from being a part of the solution. To worry is to mentally and emotionally live through a crisis before it arrives. You ever had a dream that felt real? And you woke up and you're like, holy cow. I mean, I am so glad that that didn't happen. But your emotions still have the best of you. I mean, let's face it. Come on, let's be real. There have been times in my life where I have dreamed that my spouse, Angel, right, has left me. 
and I wake up and I'm so worried and insecure, but she's there and she's asleep. I'm like, whew, man, thank goodness. There have been times where I, I have ch- felt like I've chewed my teeth out. You ever had one of those dreams and you think that you're toothless and what you're going to do and what people are going to think about you? And you wake up, you're like, oh man, my teeth are still there. I'm glad that they're there. I mean, there are a lot of times you feel like you're falling or whatever, just the reality of that dream. And you wake up and you're stressed out. And you're like, man, it hasn't happened. But the feeling's still there. That's kind of what it's like to worry. The circumstance hasn't even come about, but the feeling is there and it paralyzes you. Stressing ourselves out from worry means we're disconnecting ourselves from careful thinking and we're living in a world of irrational thinking. See, Jesus is for careful thinking. The whole Sermon on the Mount is about how you should live your life. That's the whole point. Think about how you should be living. Give careful thought to it, but don't allow it to lead you to the point where you worry and you're inactive and you're paralyzed and you don't do anything about it. Have a plan based off of God's principles. It's funny because the word worry comes from an Anglo-Saxon word. It means to choke or to strangle. That's exactly what worry does. It means to choke or to strangle. To worry is to lust after things or circumstances beyond your control. Lust simply means this. We usually attribute it to sexual uh, things, right? Lusting after sexual things. But it's basically a passion that's gone beyond the intended boundaries. You think about something before hitting stop. And we can do that with sexual things, right? We role play this thing in our mind and we lust after this person or these people and we start lusting after them to the point of sin, So we got to push stop. And that's kind of what it's like with with worry. You lust after situations. You want more money. You want more things. You want more time. You envision what it's like to have to be there. And all you do is live in this anxiety, worry-filled world. And you never do anything about it. And you don't have a plan. You see, worrying takes all the joy out of our life. Well, how does it do that? Well, first of all, I think one of the most important points is that worry chokes out the effectiveness of God's word in our life. Let me ask you a question. If there is something that you're worried about right now, when's the last time you took 15 minutes to pray and read scripture about it? When's the last time you took 15 minutes to sit down and say, you know what, God, I'm just going to pray to you about this. I'm going to read scriptures about this. I'm going to offer this up to your control. When's the last time you talked about something that has worried your heart with another brother or sister in Christ to receive encouragement? You've just given them a phone call and said, look, man, I'm really worried about my kids. I know the Bible says not to worry. I need you to help me out here. Now, if you're not busy being proactive about getting rid of your worry, your worry is going to get rid of you. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 22. He's given this illustration about the word of God falling upon four different kinds of soil. And when he gets to the worries of life, he says this, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. So a seed falls down on soil that's overcome with thorns. The seed grows, but the thorns grow faster and it chokes out the word of God from having any effectiveness in your life. And here's what's crazy. On this subject of worry and anxiety, Jesus has other different soils that he references. One of the soils refers to the work and influence of Satan. Think about that for a moment. Worry on the same example parallel with the influence and the power of demonic forces. You know what the other illustration that he gives is persecution. Worry on the same level with persecution. Now think about that category there. Persecution, satanic attacks, and worry. And here are three things that can roll out the word of God in your life. I think that's a pretty powerful statement from Jesus that worry is a really big deal. If, uh, if worry was a picture, I have a picture for you. If worry was a picture, it would look at you and say, I'm kind of a big deal. Okay, that's what it would be like. I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. That's Ron Burgundy from this terrible movie. It's like one of the worst movies ever, but this is hilarious when Ron Burgundy's like, I'm kind of a big deal. That's what worry is. Look, If you fail to recognize the kind of impact that worry can have on your life, you're losing. The battle is already won for the enemy. You've got to recognize that worry is a big deal, and it will kill God's word in your heart and in your life. This is something that we have to pay attention to. Now, what's the source of our worry? We see the status of our worry. What's the source of our worry? Where Jesus gives us four things. And as I said earlier, isn't it interesting that in the preceding verses, Jesus basically says in Matthew chapter 6, don't worry about money. He says you can't serve two masters 
at the same time. You're either going to love one and hate the other. And so you can't serve money and Jesus. One's got to be the king of your heart. And then right after talking about money, he says, therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, ask yourself, what's it there for? Do not worry about money. God's going to take care of you. That's what the Bible teaches. And so when we look at this subject of money, basically Jesus is saying you have a faith issue if you are worried about money, if worry is taking control over your life. He says this, I tell you not to worry. You can't serve both God and money. And often, isn't money a common source of our worry? I mean, we worry about our jobs. We worry about our things. And here's what I have found to be true. Often our source of worry comes from things that we do not need. Right? Car payments that we don't necessarily need. House payments that might be too big. Sports programs that have gotten too expensive. Holy cow! You know how expensive it is to put your kid in sports? I mean, my goodness, take out a second mortgage on your home for crying out loud. It is a ton of money. Everyone is sold into this idea that my kid's going to get a, 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 a college ride. When if you could take all of that money you're putting into sports and put it into a college fund, done and paid for, right? Man, holy smokes, when my kids get to sports, I'm going to be like, sorry, babe, not doing it. <laughs> you get one. That's it. But man, college uh, is really expensive. I mean, all the people who have student loans, student loan is ridiculous. Think about the hundreds of thousands of dollars people are in debt for student loans. In the end, I, was, I listen to Dave Ramsey all the time. Love Dave Ramsey. I highly encourage you to download Dave Ramsey's podcast. It's so good, all right? Dave is the man, but he's kind of a no-nonsense guy. So he's a little bit more crude and harsh with people than probably what normal people would be. But he just gets straight to the point because he's there to solve problems. He's not there to make people feel better about themselves. But here's the deal. I mean, people get hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And one person I was listening to had a degree. They couldn't even find a job. And they're $100,000 in debt. Now, I am all for education, okay? Absolutely. Get a college degree. You, you should get a college degree, in other words, or at least a trade or something like that. But man, doesn't the weight, if you have student debt, isn't that a burden on your heart that just feels like a ton of weight that's pressed upon your life? Mortgages. I mean, we go hundreds of that. I'm speaking to me here, okay? We go hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt for this house, and we build all of this pressure on our life, and we have to meet this mortgage and this car payment and all these other bills, and we worry ourselves to death about money. Most of us live paycheck to paycheck. We stress ourselves out, wondering not if we're going to make ends meet as we get Chick-fil-A that night. <laughs> yeah. Finances continue to be the leading cause of divorce in America. The divorce rate in America is 52%. 37% of those divorces are over money. You want to tell me money's not a big deal in our culture? It is the leading cause of breakups. I mean, just think about the last argument you had with your spouse, and it probably circled on something to do with money. A husband's a tightwad, maybe the wife's a spender, or vice versa. Who knows, okay? But money is at the source of a lot of our anxiety. That's why husbands and wives, we've got to get on the same page with money. But often, often this is our own doing. We bring upon these things in our life, and we believe this lie that if we can just get more, we'll solve our issues. If we can just have more, we'll solve our stress. But we get to that point, the more that we have, the less we feel. We have all of these burdens and responsibilities, and we get worried. Let me give you some encouragement this morning. I highly, highly encourage you to check out Dave Ramsey. Get up, sign up for a Financial Peace University class if you're struggling with money. Buy his book for $10 if you're struggling with money and follow the baby steps that he gives you to get yourself debt free. A few weeks ago, we talked about what it means to be outrageously generous. You cannot afford to give if you are so strapped with all of your debt. You can't be generous. You can't give to the people around you. And here's the deal. Living without giving isn't real living. If you can't afford to give, you can't afford to live. I mean, Go through your life and never being able to bless other people or support a mission. I mean, it just robs you of everything that God wants for your life. But yet we believe this lie. If I just take care of me, everything will be all right. Just a, a few practical things. First of all, Dave says, make a budget and stick to it. Don't assign $50 for out to eat money and then spend $75. Okay, sit down with your spouse or yourself, make a budget and stick to it. Number two, get out of debt. Live free. And he does what's called the debt snowball. You take the, the smallest cost that you have, you attack that debt, 
You get rid of it, and it builds momentum in your life. And then you take the next one. Sit down, write a list of all your debts, and start attacking them from the bottom up. Get rid of your debt. Stop worrying about money. Get rid of your car payments. Sell your car if you have to. Buy something cheaper. Pay off your credit card debt. And even if you have to pick up a side hustle. You know what a side hustle is? Right? A side hustle is a, a job on the side. Look, you can drive for Uber. You could drive for Uber if you have to. Take your car, take a day, go drive for Uber, make yourself a couple hundred bucks that day. Pay off a credit card. You could drive for this new company called Bungie. They're basically the trucks of Uber. If you have a truck that's decent, you can haul with them and you can pick up people's stuff and you could drive for them. Do this, download this app called Field Agent. Have you ever heard of Field Agent? There are little bounties throughout your community that you could accomplish to pick up sometimes three, four, five, six, ten bucks a task. Download an app called TaskRabbit if you're handy. You can sign up, people can hire you. I mean, there are, you deliver pizzas on the weekend or during the weeknights. You can make 1,500 bucks a month by delivering pizzas. I mean, find a way to make more money, to get yourself out of this debt. And then finally, you'll be able to invest your money. Let your money work for you. Don't spend your time slaving away for everyone else and never enjoying the blessing of work and what God has given you. And then you'll be able to be outrageously generous. So here's basically what I have found with this first subject of money. Often we place ourselves in this situation and we have to develop a plan to get out of it. Do what's necessary to get out of it. Release this burden and then you won't have to worry about your money. Uh, and you can be outrageously generous. I like what Dave Ramsey has to say. Dave Ramsey puts it like this. He says, pray like everything depends upon God and work like everything depends upon you. I like that. That's good. Pray like everything depends upon God. God, you got this. But work like everything depends upon you with a relentless mentality to get it taken care of. What's the second thing that Jesus talks about? He says, don't worry about money. But money is a vehicle for these other things. He says in verse 25, don't worry about what you shall eat. Now, most of us, we plan our day around when we get to eat next, right? We meal prep. Look, I tried meal prep and it just doesn't work for me. I got like seven of these boxes. I put a slice of pizza in each one of them and I can't find a way to lose weight when I meal prep that way. It just, I don't think it works. I don't think it works. So we bought into a lie. I'm kidding. I do, I do try to meal prep, but sometimes I do love pizza. And by sometimes, I mean like once a week. So he says, don't worry about your food. Now, in biblical times, remember, they're worried about where they're going to get their next meal. We're often worried about what kind of food we're going to eat and trying to eliminate food from our diet. So the cultural differences here couldn't be any, any greater. These people were like, where am I going to get my next meal? We're like, how many meals do I need to cut out to drop some of this weight that I've gained? But when Jesus talks about what you're going to eat and where your source of food is going to come from, he says, look, God's going to take care of you. Do not worry about that. Look at the next thing he says. Don't worry about what you shall wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And so in biblical times, they worried whether or not they'd have enough clothing for their families. They didn't get to go out and buy a new pair of sneakers every three months. They didn't go shopping on Amazon and purchase something on, uh, sometimes they can let you do those continuous things where they just send you clothes. Or you're like, I don't even know what I'm paying for, but send it to me, baby, I'll wear it. You know what I mean? I mean, we do stuff like that. So we are worried about what kind of clothes we're going to wear. They were worried about whether or not they're going to have clothes. But when it comes to what you wear, I think the, the application could be this. Don't try to fit in with everyone and making yourself broke to get there. Stop worrying about whether or not you're going to have the designer brands. A lot of you don't know, but last year, I almost wore these jeans every single Sunday, and I haven't got one comment. I'm like, blessed up. You know what I'm saying? Usually people criticize the preacher over what they wear. Not in this church, man. It's great. I have had two comments, okay? Sometimes I wear a jacket every once in a while, and one person, the only comment they ever gave me in the five years I've been here is like, I really like how you're dressed today, Rick. <laughs> I'm like, okay, thanks. I wore a I'm not wearing a jacket again. You can believe that. You're not going to compliment me and my dress code. But these, look, we're worried about what we're going to wear. And Jesus is like, don't worry about this stuff. Stop worrying about what you're going to wear. And then finally, Jesus talks about food and clothing and money. Look at verse 34. He says, do not worry about your future. The only certain thing about your future is how uncertain it's going to be. I was not worried about the hurricane that could have come up to hit Maryland, and it still might. I was concerned. And so I'm emailing Mark and our staff, trying to develop an action plan, like what we're going to do if this happens, making myself available in case I need to help people out in need. Concerned makes a plan. Worrying paralyzes you. And so we need to be a concerned church, not a worried church. 
Worry assumes this. This is the worst part about worry when it deals with our future. Worry assumes that God will not provide. That's what worry does. God doesn't have this. I have to be in control. I've got to bear the burden of responsibility. I've got to get us out of this mess. I've got to be the one in control because God doesn't provide. This is why Jesus places worry on the same level as satanic attacks and persecution. It's because worry robs you of biblical faith and it places you on the throne that God was intended to have. And that's the worst thing about worry. It's out of your control. And yet you ruin your life and your joy by trying to control the impossible. And so Jesus says, look, do not worry about your future. Tomorrow has enough worry for itself. Focus on today and now. Be concerned by making a plan, but don't live unbiblically in your worry. What's the reason? Look at what Jesus says. For the pagans worry about these things, but it shouldn't be like that for you. And so as hard as it is to accept, a Christian that worries is living and behaving as if God doesn't exist. And that's the reality. When we worry, we are saying, God, I don't think that you're there. I don't trust you. That's ultimately what we're saying. And so when we think about this idea of worry and you look at people who don't believe in God, they rely upon themselves and their own ability. Whereas Christians, we who follow after Jesus, rely upon God and his providential will. And so living like a pagan is like an animal bound to a cage, but living like a Christian is like a bird soaring through the sky and we can fly in the freedom of God. Give him the stress. Give him the worry. Give him the anxiety. Let him take care of it. Be concerned and make a plan and let God take care of the rest. One of my favorite Proverbs is plan your steps, right? The man plans his steps, but God directs his way. Ultimately, you can make as many plans as you want to, but God's providence is in control. And so we need to trust the providence of God. And so here's the key idea. Instead of worrying about your future, be concerned with a plan of action. And the foundation of your plan of action is to seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness and God will take care of you. And so we looked at the state of our worry. Uh, we looked at um, the solution of our worry is what we're going to look at next. Uh, we looked at the source of our worry, the state, the source, and now let's look at the solution. What's the solution to our worry? How do we fix it? Simply put, trust. Trusting in God. And look, look at what Jesus says here in this text. Oh, you of little faith. Man, if Jesus said that to me, I'd be like, ouch. That hurts, but it's true. I'm so concerned about being in control that I don't trust God. You see, if you trust in Jesus, you not only believe certain factual truths, but that belief leads to action, your behavior, your mentality, what you do. And so ultimately, Jesus says, you have little faith. And the words of the famous Kyle Bale, our student minister, don't let the good things get in the way of the God things. He said that this week. I was like, dude, stealing it. All right, got to give him the credit. Using it, he's like, no, 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 I want that. I want to use it for what I preach. I'm like, nope, too late, buddy. You already said it. <laughs> it's mine. Reel that one right in. But don't let the good things get in the way of the God things. And so first of all, we've got to recognize that it is our trusting relationship with God that's at fault here. That's the source of our worry. And then when we recognize that we have a faith problem, we need to understand the difference between our needs and our wants. God promises to provide for our needs. He doesn't promise to provide for your Mercedes Benz that you picked up last month, right? Or your million dollar home mortgage or your $500 out to eat fund. God doesn't promise to provide for those, but he does promise to provide for your needs. Recognize the faith issue recognize the source of what your needs really are, and let God be the one that's in control. Secondly, look at what Jesus says. He says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And he gives two illustrations. The first one are the birds. Do you ever hear birds up at night chirping? I mean, you, you'll hear an owl maybe once in a while, or a random bird once in a while. But man, when you're there in the morning, or in the afternoon and you hear the birds going compared to at night, there's a huge difference. And here's the reason why. The birds have plenty of food. They're not up, stressed out, worried about what, what am I going to eat tomorrow? You know, beep, 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 beep. What am I going to eat tomorrow? They're not doing that. They're asleep because they know there's going to be food tomorrow. And that's the example that Jesus gives. Look, if God provides for the birds, he's going to provide for you. What's the other illustration that he gives? He gives flowers. And he says, look, look at the flowers. 
I love flowers. Flowers are beautiful, okay? Look at the flowers. Look at how they're clothed. Man, flowers can just be amazing. And how they grow naturally. They really don't take a lot of input unless you're trying to like really plant flowers and make them grow. But you look at natural grown flowers and trees that have been around for hundreds of, ye- hundreds of years, and you're like, wow. I mean, they're not up spinning and turning around as, as what Jesus says. They're not worried about where am I going to get my nutrients? That's the illustration that he gives. Why? God is going to provide for the trees. And if God is going to provide for those two things, he's surely going to provide for you. And so instead of getting up and making things happen, right, when we worry, it's like sitting in a rocking chair. You're moving, but you're not going anywhere. You're just spinning. And so you've got a lot of worry, a lot of action, but no progress. And so we need to get out of our rocking chair. We need to make a plan, and we need to pray as if everything depends upon God and work as everything depends upon us. And then thirdly, look at what Jesus says in verse 33. Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. I find it powerfully true that when our minds are busy with thankfulness and praying for others, our thoughts are not occupied with worrying. So here's my encouragement to you. Listen to more sermons. Begin your day with a prayer list and a devotion. Listen to podcasts throughout the day. Occupy the thoughts of your mind with good, godly things. Paul puts it like this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. If you want to get rid of worry, pray and think. Here's the second scripture that I want to share with you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Get your heart in line with your mind. Have you ever found this to be true? You can't feel two emotions at the same time. You can't do it. And so if your emotions are constantly occupied with thanksgiving and heavenly things, there's no room for worry and anxiety and stress. And so you got to get busy in your heart and in your mind. And then thirdly and finally, when our bodies follow our mind and our heart and we do good things for others that won't have time to worry. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, Paul says, So I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How I put that simply is this. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. Like worry. Worry is a sin because God has this target that he wants us to reach in life. And we pull back our arrow and worry and we aim and we wonder and we shoot and we miss the target. We fall short of the plan that God has for our life by worry. And so if we can get our minds busy, if we can get our hearts busy with our emotions, and if we can get our bodies busy by doing something, be busy doing spiritual things and we won't be doing sinful things, we can overcome our worry.